cortical. Oh, here's how they know uh, that it works like this. So for example, with the violent criminals, they do the brain scans on them. They can see they have way less frontal lobe activity. Um, and they, of course, have also way less uh, uh, inhibition control. And people that have a lot of frontal lobe activity have much better inhibition control. Uh, the only reason we can do that is because in the 1960s, uh, we had what was called the uh, cognitive re revolution. And this was really uh, an important moment, not only in psychological history, but in human history. Because if you guys remember, I told you yesterday, there was a big debate on what determined your behavior and personality and ability the most, right? So very popular from like 1890 to the 1930s until the Nazis. It was very eugenics, social Darwinist, genetic based. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then of course people were terrified by this whole uh, eugenics program uh, in the United States and the sterilizations and then the Nazis of course uh, were a ridiculous example. Uh, they went like way over onto the uh, no environment's the determining factor. It has nothing to do with genes whatsoever. Cognitive revolution in the 60s started to change that because people started to see, oh wait, actually it turns out genes do have a pretty big impact on um, how you are, your behavior, ability, et cetera. Um, and there was a lot of resistance, especially when uh, the new field of evolutionary psychology, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, popped up because they were, they thought that anyone who said genes had an impact were just gonna turn into Hitler again. And they were very afraid of another uh, racist based um, uh, view about human beings. Uh, but as we talked about, it's, it's way different than that. In fact, it has nothing to do with your race, it's just you as an individual. Uh, your race has almost nothing to do uh, as, a, as a group with your brain structure. It's all little nuanced differences like the shade of your skin depending on um, your latitude that you, uh, your ancestors developed in or uh, your eyelids being different just because your ancestors were in the tundra and others weren't and that sort of stuff. Okay, cognitive revolution. There were several new scans that in the 60s and 70s were developed and that allowed us to see what brains did. So what regions were active, which ones were inactive during certain activities when you saw certain things, uh, during, w with different abilities between people, like someone who's uh, considered highly intelligent, somebody who's uh, on the lower end of the intelligence spectrum. So um, this gives us a chance to do that. Because again, before, it was my only way of knowing how a brain functioned. Yeah, it was basically autopsy, right? Uh, if I could see lesions and things like that. Uh, and it doesn't help us out that much if, some, if we can only look at people when they're dead because we don't even know if, like let's say somebody had a lesion um, on part of their brain, we're like, oh, that's why they uh, uh, were always angry. But it's like the lesion was back here uh, and that's actually our occipital lobe, so that wouldn't even have anything to do with that uh, in the first place. So these uh, inventions of scanning techniques uh, really changed things and showed us much, gave us a much better picture of how the brain actually works. So here's some examples you have to know uh, for the AP test. EEG, electroencephalograph, uh, computed tomography scan, CT scan, uh, positron, no, oh, I forget what PET scan stands for. Positron, emission, emission. emission topography, thank you. Emission scan, um, MRI, I forget that's a magnetic resonating imaging. Magnetic resonating imaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then this is very similar, it's called an fMRI, functional MRI. Uh, and here's how they work, roughly speaking. So all of these, you can observe somebody's neural activity in their brain uh, in various situations, and you're not gonna damage the person, all right? So you're not gonna have to like cut open their brain and look or anything like that. You can just hook them up to these things, and without any real negative um, developments, you can see what's going on in there, at least what's doing what, all right? You can't see exactly how it works, you have to look at the neural level for that. Uh, but you can at least see <clears throat> which parts of the brain are active and which parts are inactive to certain activities. <clears throat> my throat went dry for a second there. <clears throat> Coughed out. I show that happened in my first period, like the first day of school. I was like talking about it, all of a sudden I just go, oh, and it just goes dry, and I just cough for like 10 minutes straight. I had to like write for what they should do. I was like, okay, <clears throat> and I'm like writing, do this, because I couldn't even talk. Anyway, so EG, that one is they are looking at the electrical activity in your brain. All right, so what are they, what are they really looking at if I'm looking at my brain's electrical activity? Your yeah, your neurons communicating, exactly. So they can see which, one of your, which parts of your brain light up. 
uh, your uh, neurons. So this is something they could theoretically look at <coughs> if um, they were trying to see inhibition control. All right. So let's say uh, they were trying to see how long you can hold off on not eating something you really like. Like they could put the thing in front of you, like let's pretend you're starving. Like you haven't eaten for 24 hours and they take your favorite food and they put it right in front of you and they hook you up to this EEG and they say, all right, how long can you resist on not eating that thing, whatever it is, all right? Where are they gonna see a lot of activity? Well, they'll see a lot of activity all over, first of all, because you're gonna be like, Arr. but where, where would I see somebody who's more likely to wait longer than somebody else? Yeah, you'd see probably more frontal lobe activity, right? And this is kind of how they did the prison scan thing, was uh, they saw when they would scan them, uh, look at their electro, electro activity, there was very little going on in the frontal lobe compared to um, normal uh, people uh, who are not in prison for a violent uh, crime, all right? Uh, electro activity, and again, <clears throat> you can look at that uh, from a top view or a bottom view. Oops, from a top view or a bottom view, or side view rather, uh, to see, oh look, um, when they're trying not to do something, it's really active uh, in these regions. And that gives you an idea of what those regions can do. They give you like a complex math problem. They see, oh, well, what do you know? This part lights up in the frontal lobe, right? They give you uh, a bunch of images that change colors a lot and uh, are, are varying in distance from you. You'll see a lot of activity over here. Oh, that must be where you uh, process the seeing information. They give you a lot of different sounds. They see, oh, it's very active here. Uh, sorry, over here. Uh, that must be, of course, where uh, uh, your auditory processing is occurring. Uh, and they can give it, get a good idea of that. Oh, when people talk, where would I find the... Uh, if somebody's listening and then speaking, what are the regions I might see light up? Broca and Vernica, right? I would see a lot of activity in those areas. Other areas, too, right? Because you're thinking about what you want to say. So you'll see activity everywhere. You'll see a lot uh, in those areas. Which side of my brain would I see that on, by the way? The left, right? Which is what I'll get, to, get into here in a second. All right, that's electrical. CT, PET, fMRI. Uh, this is a, basically just an x-ray. This is one you don't want to do too much because it actually could damage your DNA. Um, but this is how you look at the tissue to see if there is a lesion or, or, or it could potentially show you where a tumor may or may not be, uh, things like that. That's more looking at tissue. But nonetheless, it's very helpful uh, to see um, like over the summer, I had a kidney stone, which were terrible, uh, and they CT scanned me uh, on my kidney and bladder and the ureter in between, and they're like, yep, sure enough, they could just see there's a little thing stuck right in there blocking my ureter between the kidney uh, and the bladder. Uh, that's CT scan, so that's how you can see uh, tissues sometimes, and then you can see, of course, if there's a, an abnormality uh, or a tumor or something else going on. PET scan. This one is actually, I forget the chemical itself, but it's, it's measuring, they basically inject you and they see your, your glucose usage and blood flow. Uh, and that gives us a good idea, of course, of which regions are active or not, uh, because ones that have increased blood flow and glucoactivity means uh, you're using energy uh, in those regions, so they're, of course, gonna be active. Uh, and the ones that aren't so much aren't really responsible for whatever role is being played there, all right? Um, if somebody were to, I'm sitting there, I'm hooked up to any one of these, well, not the CT scan. I'm hooked up to an EEG or a PET scan and somebody comes up and pinches my arm super hard. Like, ow, what's gonna light up? Motor cortex? Right, well, motor cortex might if I move my arm. Where's my sensory processed? Hmm? Yeah, that's where it would be, right? And uh, that's more so by where the parietal lobes are uh, up in that region. But they're actually right next to also the um, uh, motor cortex as well. But yeah, uh, I could actually see where that would happen. And by the way, if somebody pinched my left arm, I would actually see the activity on uh, the right hemisphere. Because, and this is also in the notes, this is a weird part, and we only discovered this because of uh, brain scans and later when we, we start severing the corpus callosum, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we can see that uh, there's a phenomenon known as brain lateralization, which means 
all my sensory info, whether it's vision, uh, whether it is, I'm not sure if hearing is this way, but I know vision uh, and movement and touch are all actually hooked up to the other side of your brain. All right, so my right side, the senses and movement here, that's actually dictated and run by my left hemisphere, not my right, and vice versa. My left side, uh, movement and sensory uh, information, and in my eye too, uh, is processed by my right side. All right, that's brain lateralization. It basically means uh, right hemisphere. So again, that's my hemisphere. Uh, controls left motor and sensory, and vice versa. All right, that means the left hemisphere controls your uh, right side motor and um, sensory information. All right, and they know that from brain scans, and they also know that from, uh, and this is where, uh, I think in your notes, uh, this is a guy named uh, Michael Gazinga, or Gazinga, and Roger Sperry, they both done different research on it, but it's, but it's related. They found out that your two hemispheres are just like the parts of your, your brain, but your two hemispheres in your uh, cortical regions, they're actually two different brains. Like they're not the same thing. The only reason it seems like one part or one cortical layer is because they communicate so fast. But they found that this little uh, bridge between the two hemispheres, called the corpus uh, callosum or callosum, that's what allows the two parts of the brain to talk. All right. So what they found was uh, some people that would have seizures because there was like too much neural activity and then it would cause their, brain, uh, their body to seize. They were able to cure it, for the most part, when they cut this, severed it. So now the two hemispheres are separated completely. They have no idea of the information that the other one holds, all right? But they didn't know that meant anything because the people would go on and, and they seemed to operate totally normally, okay? But when, this is how they found that out, when they would intentionally uh, prevent one side of your body, like your eye, for example, from experiencing a sensation, they figured out that um, the other part of the brain had no idea. And here's what I mean by that. So they took these patients in which they had severed that corpus callosum, so the two hemispheres cannot talk, all right? Normally it doesn't matter, because if I see a word with both of my eyes, uh, who cares because my right eye can see it, my left eye can see it, so my left hemisphere sees the words and I can say them. All right, so I could just read this and be like, even if my corpus callosum was severed, I could read this and be like, oh, it says EEG. All right, what would happen though if I covered my right eye and read EEG? Would I be able to say that? No. I wouldn't, right because my right eye is the one that takes in the information, my left eye is my speech, or sorry, my left side of my brain is my speech. So they found that when they show people words, um, like for example, the eyes, and they blocked the right eye, and they told them, uh, go uh, get up and leave the room. The person would read it, and they'd get up, and they'd walk to the door, and they'd be like, hold on a second, where are you going? And the person would turn around, and they would say, uh, I'm going to get a Coke because they didn't know that they had been told to get up and stand and walk out. Their brain just kind of made up an answer. Why did, they, why did their brain have to make up an answer? Because the other side wasn't aware of Yeah. The left side of the brain had no idea why it got up to walk and talk. All right, because the right eye was blocked. So my, <laughs> but the right side of my brain saw the words and it responded. But for me to express that, my left hemisphere has to know that information. Did it know the information? No, because my right side got it from my left eye, but it didn't communicate it to the left hemisphere. So my speech couldn't, didn't have the info, it didn't know. So it just made something up. All right, it's just like, oh yeah, because I'm thirsty, because I'm gonna get a Coke, that's why. Not, not that because uh, uh, they were uh, asked to go outside uh, based on a written command. All right, and they found the same thing in reverse. Anytime you gave uh, information to somebody, uh, like with the example I just gave you, he couldn't tell you why um, he got up, but if you gave him a uh, pencil with his left hand, he could write why he was going out the door because he was told to or whatever, all right? And that's because the right side of your brain, the right hemisphere, controls the left hand, 
All right, I know this is getting really complicated, but let me just back it up here and tell you the whole thing uh, from the start. So, sever the corpus callosum, right? So my two hemispheres cannot talk to one another. All right, but I don't notice that if both of my eyes can see everything because uh, my right eye is seeing it, then my left side of the brain knows it and I can, I can talk about it. But if I sit down and you cover my right eye and I look at it uh, and I see that it tells me to go and leave, uh, I'll, I'll remove it and I'll go walk out. And if you ask me, why did you get up? The left side of my brain has no idea. It never got the information, so it makes something up. But if... Um, you told me to write down the answer. I could, but only with my left hand. All right. And the reason why I can only write with my left hand is because who's controlling my left hand? The right, it's the right hemisphere. That actually saw the info. Left eye saw it, goes to my right hemisphere, so it can tell my left hand to write the answer. I wouldn't be able to write it with my right hand, though, because that's controlled by my left hemisphere. My left hemisphere has no idea. All right, so that's what they figured out. And again, it doesn't really matter all that much because even if you have that severed to, to help out your epilepsy or whatever, uh, as long as both eyes can see it, it doesn't really matter because then you can express it uh, however you want to. And uh, you might not be able to write it with one hand. No, you would be able to because you can still see it even with that eye. Uh, but if you ever are, are, are covered up for whatever reason, uh, it, will, it will impact that. But that was an odd discovery they found. And of course, later on, uh, as these scans get more developed, and we start using them better, we have a much better standing of how the brain works, how certain regions are responsible for certain roles. Um, and, um, oh, I forgot to talk about MRIs. Um, and we can use these scans to sort of give us a good idea on that. All right, uh, MRI is, a, that's a more complicated one. Uh, the way I understood it was it scrambles your electrical activity, your, uh, your electrons, and then it resets them. Uh, and it can use that information uh, to tell what your basic structure is and your basic use is. Um, if they do a whole bunch sequence, like if they scramble, unscramble, scramble, unscramble, scramble, unscramble, uh, they can kind of see what your brain's doing. That's the fMRI. So this is one single image of where they scramble my uh, electrons and uh, re-scramble and get a picture of it. That only gives me one second in time. But an fMRI is kind of like a flip book. Uh, they are essentially doing a whole bunch of images back to back and I can see how my brain is moving and, and reacting to uh, whatever it's doing. All right, so fMRI is like a flip book MMRI. It's like instead of one picture, it's a whole bunch that I can, you know, watch back to back and see how things are moving and changing. All right, <clears throat> so these scans, of course, are going to allow me to uh, see a lot of brain in imaging and uh, they're going to really start piecing together starting the 60s and 70s. Uh, how this brain works uh, and interacts. So, what I think we have left to talk about is demyelination. We pretty much just have hemispheric specialization, which actually we already know. I'm actually just gonna tell you that right now. Brain lateralization means the right side controls the left and the left side controls the right, as far as sense and motor, right? It just controls the opposite. That's all that one means. Hemispheric specialization, is actually different. I know the terms kind of sound the same, but you already have one example. Where's all my language going to be processed and expressed? All on the left, right side can't do it. Right. So this means that um, while both sides generally do the same things, there are some things that only one side does or predominantly does. In the case of language, uh, most of my language is processed in the left. In fact, that's, if I want to express it and, and understand it, it's all on the left. Um, also, my left hemisphere is more so responsible for things I already know, mastering things I already know. It's not as good at uh, the problem solving portion. It's, it's more my like organizing side of my brain. All right, so understanding things I already know. So this is where my uh, language, we already got that. Um, that's where my um, mastery and organization of uh, information goes. All right, that's like the order side of my brain. The right side of my brain deals with the chaos. This is the one that is the problem solving mostly side. That's my creativity side. That's the one that tries to process new information and turn it into understood information. So here's my understood side. And then my right, roughly speaking, uh, does most of my problem solving, most of my creative uh, thinking and work, and most of my, um, this is what I'm looking for dealing with new information, processing new information. 
So sometimes they say this is the logical mathematical side and this is the uh, uh, creative side. You'll see pictures of like a bunch of numbers and uh, equations uh, on this side and on the right side it's like a bunch of paint because it's your creative side. It's oversimplifying but that's basically what you'll see. If you see a new problem that you've never seen before and I did a brain scan, you'd see a lot of activity on the right frontal lobe as you're trying to figure it out. If I saw a problem I already knew that I was trying to uh, uh, restructure or master, uh, I would see a lot more activity on my left frontal lobe. All right, that's kind of how it works. So that's those two terms. And then um, in study hall, we will talk about the field of evolutionary psychology, plasticity, and epigenetics. And that'll be it. So yeah, back it up, hold on. Lift off on hemispheric specialization. Oops, theory. So we learned about brain lateral lateralization, how the left uh, lobe controls the right sensory motor, and then the right uh, lobe controls the left sensory motor. Uh, and they're kind of crisscrossed, and they found that out again when they severed the corpus callosum uh, in the Gazinga sphere experiments, and later uh, Sperry did work with it too, uh, where they would, you know, cover their eye. They could only uh, give the answer correctly when the uh, right eye saw it, because they could speak it. Uh, but then if the only left side saw it, they couldn't say it, but they could write it with their left hand because only the right hemisphere knew the info, uh, and that's your speech is on the left side. So specialization means, and again, there's a lot of crossover, by the way, where both sides of the brain do the same thing, but there is some specialization uh, to a certain degree. Uh, the left side, what are some of the things that it's broadly responsible for? Well, like speaking and Okay, language, organization, mastery. This is dealing with stuff you already know. This is the area what, that deals with the known. Right? So when, you, when you're familiar with something, you're like, oh, I know this, and you go through it, it's because it's, it's embedded in your left side. That doesn't mean it's all 100% the left side, but uh, that deals with it more so than the right. And the right, then, what are some characteristics of the right hemisphere? Um, exploring the ideas. Okay, cool, so this is the unknown. This is the one that tries to solve things and figure them out. Um, this is the, uh, yeah, we do like the majority of your problem solving. Again, not all of it, but you'll see a lot of it if you're trying to figure something out for the first time or make sense of it, your right frontal lobe is gonna be more active. Okay, what else? Creativity. Yeah, creativity. So this is more the structure, this is kind of the unstructured, and if, if you are creative, this is where your creativity is gonna be. Uh, we'll talk about creativity later. Creativity is actually extremely rare. I mean like real creativity. Um, for something to be creative, not only does it have to be new and novel, which is really hard to do, think of something entirely new, like make a whole new industry or make a whole new type of whatever uh, with no you know, previous models to go off of, or even if you are improving a previous model, it's still really hard. But it also has to be valuable. Because if it's just novel, then random is creative. And I could just go, blah, 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 blah. It's like, well, that was creative, wasn't it? No one's ever said that before. It's like, no, that has no value whatsoever, right? So it has to both be new and novel, and it has to be valuable, have, have value to people, uh, improve their lives, wanted, et cetera. So actual creativity uh, is extremely rare. Uh, most people never experience any um, uh, creativity, true creativity. Um, it's, a lot of it is generated by a very small amount of people who generate a lot of that creativity for whatever reason. We don't entirely understand it yet because uh, we don't even understand where thoughts come from. But creativity is different because it's like a brand new thought out of nowhere. Um, it's an insight just comes to you. All right. Uh, we'll do some tests uh, and some more so fun things when we get to the unit because we can kind of see a little bit maybe how creative you are or are not. So it'll be, it'll be fun, maybe. All right. So. <clears throat> Those are the uh, hemispheres. Oh, and I have accidentally correctly put them on the right spot as if you were looking at it. I, I could have easily written left and right, but I just did that automatically. All right, so hemispheric specialization, I wanted to go to, oh, association areas from that. So since we're talking about the cortical regions, right? All those lobes, the outer layer of your brain, the most human of the layers, especially the frontal lobe. Um, that, those cortical layers, they're called association areas sometimes, depending on what you're talking about. And the reason why we're giving them that term is because these are all areas 
I don't want to say they don't have a fixed role, because there's definitely some things parts of that cortical region cannot do. For example, your frontal lobe will not process uh, visual and auditory information. Like if you damage your occipital lobe, there is some evidence to suggest that your uh, um, auditory uh, regions in the temporal lobe could take some of that weight potentially because hearing and vision both kind of deal with uh, uh, distance and space and things like that. So they can kind of take over some of those functions if you're like born blind or deaf or whatever, uh, your brain can sort of adapt to that. But if uh, I go blind or I'm born blind, I'm not gonna be able to uh, process visual information in my frontal lobe. They can't, those neurons cannot perform that function. Uh, that circuitry cannot perform it, all right? But when we say association areas, we mean uh, all of these lobes, all right, we learned uh, some of them, occipital, temporal, parietal, frontal, all right? Temporal, occipital. There's a lot of interplay between them. Uh, and this has to do with two different things. This is your uh, sensory processing, but it's also your perception. Uh, no, let's just say perception, not perception processing. So they're all going to interact and speak with one another and communicate and share the load of processing information. Uh, and some of you are gonna be confused looks, and that's fine, and we, let me try to explain it. So we all recognize what a gunshot sounds like, right? Okay. But we probably have different perceptions of that sound. Um, there are certain situations where a gunshot is not threatening. If I'm at a shooting range, unless I'm standing in front of the guns or something stupid, I'm probably not in danger. I'm going to hear the shooting constantly. I'm not going to be like, ah, 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 every time, you know, it's not going to be fearful. But if you're in a situation like you're in a store or you're, God forbid, at school or something like that and you hear gunshots, it's a totally different sound, correct? Like the sound itself isn't different, right? I'm still getting the same uh, uh, vibrations and it's still going and being processed the same. But what's different about it? Your reaction towards the situation. Your, your perception of that sound, right? You're in a situation where a gunshot is not okay, right? So that automatically uh, you're going to uh, uh, perceive that differently. So that's the perception portion of it. So senses, again, just the information. Perception is how you interpret that information. Is it threatening? Is it not threatening? Is it, uh, obviously I don't have gunshots anymore. Is it familiar or good or loving or, or beneficial? You know, uh, That all depends on how you process it, okay? That can be partly your experience, right? With gun, if we're talking about guns, your experience with guns. Um, that could be part of, well, we can drop the guns thing, but all sensory information and, uh, and perception, you're gonna have intermixing of your own conscious thought, assessing like, is this a good thing, is this a bad thing, is this something I want, is this something in my goal, whatever. Uh, also your memory uh, of that particular sound or situation. And all of these lobes, while they are kind of specialized, like again, this is kind of hearing, more hear so hearing specialized, this is more so visual information specialized, uh, this is more focusing on you know, uh, uh, touch and motor, sensory motor, and this is more so your very human roles of social reasoning and judgment and problem solving and all that. They do very much all interact uh, when they uh, are being, when they're being used, all right? So almost never, if something's happening, do I see no activity in other parts of it and all of the activity in one. Um, there are some occasions where that's occurring, but a lot of times there's communication between them. Uh, because these are all associated. They all contribute to the functioning of you taking information, interpreting it, and acting on it. All right, so that's why we call them association areas. I don't know if I made that any more clear, but um, that's my best shot at it. All right, so here's, a, here's an important piece of information uh, that might help. So it, these, the way we use them is a, is a mix of taking the sense, interpreting it, and we use our experience uh, to interpret those informations those informations. That information, uh, we use our, our, our actual thinking, our processing, our conscious thought. Um, those are all factors that go into taking in sensory information and perceiving it. All right. The reason we call them association areas is <clears throat> these are, this is one of the only regions of the brain where if I go in and I probe it, like I poke it or I give it electrical stimulation, I don't get like a response in my body. It's not like I go to my frontal lobe, give it a little jolt of electricity or a probe and my leg moves. That's not how it works. When you probe these parts of the brain, push it, prod it, poke it, uh, give it electrical stimulation, nothing happens, uh, visibly anyway. 
Now, if I give it electrical stimulation, I might like see images or, or have different thoughts or things like that, but it's not like I can just poke a region in it and it, and it, it will move me or have a specific function, all right? Uh, these are all regions that have to deal with, like I said, these mental processes of processing um, sensory information and perceiving it using combinations of your own experience uh, and your thought in the situation itself, all right? That's the association areas R. Will you see them in the test? I'm not sure. It is definitely in their unit guide objectives, and that's kind of a, a general way for me to describe what it is. Uh, but this is where you are, essentially, uh, a lot of your personality uh, and ability are, are here, because this is your ability to uh, sense things uh, and then perceive them and think and act on them. So a lot of that's going on there. You still have a lot of limbic system uh, influence, obviously, with uh, emotions and moods and things like that, but a lot of your very human activity uh, takes place here in the association areas, all right? Uh, oh, I guess you could put it with memory, the experience of memory. They're kind of the same, kind of different, but uh, memory's definitely a big part of that as well, all right? So um, the reason why people focus so heavily on this region, I think I go next to plasticity, Yes, I do, is uh, this region of the brain is at least partly uh, plastic. And I don't mean like the, the material plastic. I mean, it can actually be uh, formed to be used for a different function sometimes. Here's what I mean by that. So this area uh, is plastic or uh, has some, to some extent plasticity. What I mean by plasticity is it's like adaptable, all right? It can kind of change its function to a certain degree. Uh, and here's what I mean by that. Because we know this uh, specifically when talking about uh, people who lose limbs, um, people who lose uh, sight or are born without it or lose their hearing or are born without it. Their brain can sort of adapt to their situation. So let's say somebody is uh, born uh, deaf. They can't hear, nothing. That's it, all right? And they can't get cochlear implants because it's uh, 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 a, a neuron. It, it's, a, it's a problem with the nerves, not the actual cochlea. Those you can get a cochlear implant and, and potentially hear. Um, but let's pretend there's no chance of them hearing, okay? What their brain can do is, since they can't hear, is this part of the brain gonna be super active with no uh, uh, auditory information coming in? No. So, to adapt, the brain can, and this is where you get the plastic term where, where it's adapting, the brain can take these neurons that are not being used for hearing because there is no hearing information, uh, and they can use them uh, to help out the uh, visual fields in understanding language. Because if I can't hear, it makes it really hard to speak because I don't know if I'm speaking correctly and I don't know what it sounds like. Maybe I could read lips, but. How is the, uh, what's the most common way for uh, people who are born deaf to communicate? Sign language, right. So the uh, regions of your brain that normally interpret, interpret uh, language, auditory language, they actually sort of shift to uh, interpret visual language, all right? So we'll, we'll see in a, in a deaf person, for example, uh, these regions of the brain uh, would light up when they're speaking visually, right, with ASL. Uh, whereas if I was a person uh, who had a normally functioning um, uh, uh, hearing capability, then I would uh, probably not see that that region very active if um, I was, uh, I think I'm saying it backwards. I would not see that my occipital lobe is very active uh, during uh, speech or not as active, it'd be both regions. But these can, to some degree, sort of uh, share the load if they have to. Because again, I mentioned this before, they kind of have a similar function. They both deal with, whether it's sound or visual stimulation, uh, it's both vibrations. If you guys didn't know that, light is essentially just wavelengths, uh, and so is sound. And so they both have to deal with taking in uh, wavelength information and then trying to figure out how far away it is uh, or how big it is. Uh, so they're, the functions are similar-ish to the point that if you, uh, like I said, damage your vision or hearing or are born with it, uh, these areas of the brain can uh, utilize their plasticity and adapt uh, so they can uh, help out whichever one needs help. So again, again, if I'm born uh, deaf, I'm going to recruit some of my occipital lobe um, uh, region uh, to help me out with the processing um, and, and the temporal lobe for part of the processing. There's some crossover there. All right. They found it for movement too and sensation. Uh, 
the uh, if I like lost sensation in a limb, uh, I'll actually sometimes um, gain sensation in other limbs. And I don't mean like uh, if I lose my hearing, I can see better, or if I lose my vision, I can hear better. That's not what I mean per se. What I mean is they can process more information, all right, like bits of information. So I might be able to feel more intensely in my left hand uh, if I have lost my uh, right hand or something like that, because that's just parts of your brain that don't have anything to do. So what they do is they uh, dedicate their circuitry to helping out other parts uh, of the senses uh, if and when they can. Does it happen every time in exactly the same way? No, but we do know that it does happen sometimes that regions of the brain that have similar functions can uh, help out the other uh, areas that might be uh, suffering. Because again, like I said, you lost a limb uh, or whatever. Do you guys know what I say when I say bits of information, by the way? I feel like maybe you don't, at least some of you don't. I mean like for computers, like bits or bytes as you might know them. Here's an example. Uh, whether it's your phone or a computer, if I am going to uh, try to open up a web page, whatever it is, let's just let's just say YouTube, because right, that's an intense one, there's a lot of things on there. Is it gonna load more quickly if I have 57 other tabs open, running videos and other things, or if I open it by itself? By itself, by itself right. That's because if I have a bunch of other tabs open or I'm doing something else, like I'm, I'm converting a video or something, I'm dedicating a lot of the uh, uh, processing power, the bits, um, of my computer to something else. So that means when, so I'm using it for my 57 tabs, that's probably almost all of my uh, available uh, processing speed and power, right? So it's like, oh, 90% of my processor is going to these 57 tabs. So I try to open my YouTube, uh, new YouTube tab, which normally takes maybe 5%. So it's gonna experience a, a large delay in borrowing bits between the two and, and waiting for that, all right? But if it's all by itself and I'm using no bits, uh, it'll open up uh, much more quickly because I'm not using them for something else. So it's kind of like that. If I lose my right arm in an accident, do I need to sense or move this part of my body anymore? No, it's gone, right? So those neurons uh, that used to do that, they can pick up sensory and motor um, um, functions for other parts of my body. That's the plastic part I'm talking about, all right? So now I might be able to feel more intensely uh, or efficiently because those neurons have uh, dedicated themselves to another use with a similar function, all right? I'm I don't forget that they have to have a similar function too, by the way. That's what I said earlier. If I uh, go blind, it doesn't mean that I can use these neurons for judgment and thinking and rationality. Uh, they don't perform that function, but they could help perform uh, a function that's related to uh, hearing because they very, very, they're very similar, the circuitry. Same with sensation. Right, if I lose uh, feeling in my left arm, or sorry, lose my right arm in an accident, uh, it could dedicate those uh, circuits to another sensory function or motor function. But I can't use those neurons to, like I said, uh, think or judge uh, or whatever. So they can't do anything, but they can adapt a little bit uh, if the function is similar. Does that make sense? All right, so that's what plasticity means uh, when we talk about it. When they first discovered this, they like went way overboard with it. Um, the people who liked the whole blank slate idea about 100% society explaining your behavior and ability loved this idea. They're like, look, neurons can do anything, but they found out really quickly that no, they can't. They can only do things that are similar to their own uh, uh, function, all right? So again, if I have damage in my frontal lobes, uh, none of these uh, neurons, I don't know, I don't know the specifics, I'm not, I'm not a cognitive scientist, I know for sure none of these neurons could help out in the function of that. Maybe some of these um, neurons in the frontal lobe already might be able to take some of the load, I don't know. But I know for sure that these ones have totally different functions uh, with sensory information and they can't process this type of information. All right, so you damage this, uh, these, ain't, these are not gonna help. Uh, you damage this, these ones are not gonna help. But if I damage this, these might help. If I damage this, these might help because they're uh, very close uh, in function. You with me on that? All right, that's plasticity. Your brain uh, adjusting adjusting uh, to circumstance. But again, this, the brain cells cannot do anything. They can only uh, help repair or aid similar functions.
There is too, and I mentioned this earlier, you can actually grow new brain cells, but it's just, we still don't quite understand how it works. And I know all the images I've seen where they show, look, this is the growth of new cells because they're somehow able to track that um, with the uh, speed of development, like new cells grow quicker so they can see it somehow. Um, the images I've seen, they don't seem to be much in the cortical regions. I've seen them more in like the limbic system brainstem area. But I, I know that while you can make some new brain um, cells called neurogenesis, it's a very low amount. And as you grow older, you're less and less able to make new um, brain cells. All right, so if you're engaging in activities that uh, kill brain cells, like uh, sports where you're getting concussions frequently, or uh, certain drugs, alcohol, things like that, that kill brain cells, uh, you are not even coming close to equaling the amount that you're making new, because you make very few new ones. Uh, so again, if any activities that are damaging your brain cells, you're way in the negative. Uh, don't be like, oh, I'll, I'll make some more. No, you won't. Not enough, anyway. Uh, to replace them. But they're also not going to be the same spot. Like if I have a concussion, I damage some of my frontal lobe, like there's no guarantee those neurons are going to be generated here. Um, they're just going to, uh, they're going to be less in number and you don't know if it's going to be in the right area. You guys got that? Yes, sir. Okay, cool. So just know the cortical regions, the association areas, they all are um, communicate to uh, process information and act. And uh, there is some degree of adaptability uh, and plasticity if the functions are similar. We're good? Yes. All right, cool. That's brain repair. And what am I moving on to next? Okay, area specialized, got that. Okay, we've also talked already about how the biggest factor in uh, how your brain is uh, shaped and molded and like the, um, the density of neurons and the sizes of the, of the brain and all that and the connections between them, that's largely genetic, right? We've got those little molecules that are genetic that guide those neurons and encourage them to sprout this way or more of them this way or discourage them or, or whatever. Um, there are some environmental factors that can affect that though. And we've talked about epigenetics before, right? So epigenetics is a, is a both. It's both uh, genes, because we're talking about our actual genes, but the environment impacting your genes, right? So I'm not talking about like, oh, my parents raised me this way, so it changed my genes. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about physical factors, whether it's in your body or, or the body of your mother, uh, that actually change your gene expression, right? They turn on different ones. And I think I told you earlier, you have 34,000 genes. Do they all just have one thing? It's just, if it's on, it does this, and if it's off, it does that? What are, what, how is it more complicated? Yeah, they interact with each other, right? So you, this one gene might do one thing you turn on, but it also might turn this one off and this one on, which turns this one off. There's all kinds of complicated interactions, all right? So that's known as your gene expression, like which ones are on and which ones are off for the most part. I'm oversimplifying, but that's kind of it. Epigenetics can also do that. They can go in and turn uh, genes on and off or, or change their form, all right? So let's look at uh, an X chromosome again, a double X chromosome. That, was, that one's way worse for some reason. I'm just going to redo that one. There we go. Okay, so I've got different uh, genes and alleles in there, and uh, they're going to be uh, active and inactive at different points in my life. Uh, and my uh, body determines sort of what's doing that and when, right? So epigenetics is some environmental factor that causes certain genes to turn on or off. We talked about some of them. All right, so let's focus on just the womb for right now. In the womb, what are some factors that could potentially alter my DNA by turning, activating or deactivating certain genes or even maybe uh, um, mutating some? Stress. Okay, stress. Um, yeah, your mother experiencing stress could have that impact. It's, it's more so for yourself when you're developing, because I could, but stress is definitely one that can impact your uh, uh, genetic expression. And I'll talk about how here in a second. Let's get the list first, then I'll tell you how the, the common fact, what the common factor here is. Drugs? Drugs can, yeah. Alcohol. That's why uh, they tell you not to uh, use cap your, your mothers anyway, or, or you if you're going to be a mother. Uh, they tell you not to drink caffeine when you're pregnant, or um, you know eat fish, because it's got, uh, well, that's actually toxin, but that might have mercury in it, and mercury can do this. So I'll put that up there, actually. Um, toxins. So in this case, like mercury, lead, 
all those arsenic, things like that. That's actually poison technically, but those are all things that can also change your gene expression. Okay, what else? Her diet. Your diet? Yeah, we'll say it's related to the toxins, but you're right. You're right. Uh, and diet meaning, again, if I eat a bunch of fish, maybe I get too much mercury, and that can act as, a, as a, an epigenetic um, activator or deactivator. Um, so that's why they tell you not to uh, use caffeine or drugs or alcohol or eat a lot of fish and things like that. Um, there's another one, too, which is, uh, and I don't know all of the, the spectrum of viruses that this applies to, but viruses can do the same thing. Uh, they can impact your gene expression too, all right? And all of these is kind of like a, um, I don't know if stress would be considered this, but for now I'm gonna, look, I'm gonna lump it in. These are all called teratogens. Those are things that can, uh, uh, elements that can uh, change your gene expression. All right, so here's how they could do it. Um, oh, I forgot two, we forgot hormones. How did we forget that? I wouldn't call that a, a teratogen though, because that's a very natural process. But hormones can change your gene expression too. We talked about that, right? How if you get a bunch of testosterone, that's gonna actually change the layout of your brain, uh, which might make you more likely to uh, be better with spatial um, factors and features, uh, as opposed to uh, arithmetic. Right, they notice that difference uh, with testosterone exposure in the womb. Uh, so hormones will be on that list. But here's how it actually happens. If you zoom in, there are these tiny little molecules, and I'm not, I don't think that these are responsible in every case, but this can be the case. There are these tiny little mo molecules called methyl molecules. Methyl molecules. There's other proteins that can do this too, but uh, they're the ones that can go around, uh, depending on your exposure to any of these teratogens uh, or potentially hormones, they're the ones that can go around and turn cer certain genes on and certain genes off. And again, it's not just, oh, I turned one gene off so it has one impact. It could have many. It could turn off that gene, which stops its function, but also by turning that gene off, you turn to this one on, which turned this one off, and it can change a lot about your actual uh, expression. Uh, and that's what epigenetics is, and that's a major factor as well. Uh, and it's a bigger factor, like we talked about, the younger you are. So when you're gestating, that's when you're at your highest risk, obviously, because your body's changing the most as your brain is shaping. Uh, and then increasingly, as you age, until you're about mid-20s, your brain's done uh, developing, uh, that's when you uh, are not as worried about these things. But you are progressively less worried the older you get until your brain's done developing for the most part. But those are epigenetics, and that's how these factors, in the womb and out of the womb as you're developing, can actually change your genes. So it's not as simple as saying, oh, that's genetics, because it's not. It is your genes, it is your biology, but the environment is physically activating or deactivating parts of those genes, uh, so it changes your gene expression. Right? So there's lots of different factors here. Uh, when it determines how I actually turn out regarding intellectual ability, um, talents, and um, personality, likes, dislikes, my likelihood of speaking out sooner than somebody else, that sort of stuff uh, is determined by genes for your structure, epigenetics for your expression, and then of course you have uh, social influence as well that uh, are circumstantial and upbringings that do have um, a bit of an impact as well. Any questions about epigenetics? Sweet.